of the Mesa Arts Center in Arizona. He is also the former president and CEO of Arts Common, which is located in Calgary. Over the next five years, Johan will lead the implementation of the Arts Center's newly created strategic plan titled Arch Connect. The purpose of this plan is for the Arch Center to continue to look for new ways for the center to engage with our community. This afternoon, we have the distinct pleasure to be joined by a very esteemed group of panelists. Our first guest is Ms. Brenda Alford. Ms. Alford is a native of Baltimore who has resided in Miami since 1992. A graduate of the University of Miami Frost School of Music, she's a highly acclaimed jazz vocalist, a songwriter, a recording artist, an author, a poet, and a retired educator. Ms. Alford was personally encouraged to become a professional vocalist by Ella Fitzgerald and counted Carmen McRae, Betty Carter, and Abby Lincoln among her many fans and encouragers. She is the founder of the Miami Jazz Cooperative, a member of the board of directors of the Sunshine Jazz Organization, and the past national director of the Continental Societies. She produced the inaugural Continental Societies Jazz Festival, which raised thousands of dollars in scholarships for scholarship funding for local students. Welcome, Brenda. Next, we have Ms. Valerie Coleman. Ms. Valerie Coleman is Performance Today's 2020 Classical Woman of the Year and was described by a critic from the Washington Post as one of the, the top 35 female composers in classical music. A native of Louisville, Kentucky, Valerie began her music studies at the age of 11 and by the age of 14 had written three symphonies. She is the founder, creator, and former flutist of the Grammy-nominated Imani Woods, one of the world's premier chamber music ensembles. She is currently an assistant professor of performance chamber music and entrepreneurship at the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami. She is perhaps best known for Umoja, a composition that is widely recognized and is listed by Chamber Music America as one of the top 101 great American ensemble works. With over two decades of conducting master classes, lectures, and clinics across the country, Ms. Coleman is a highly sought after clinician and recitalist. In 2011, she created a summer mentorship program in New York City for highly advanced collegiate and postgraduate musicians called Imani Witt's Chamber Music Festival. Now in its ninth season, the festival has welcomed musicians from over 100 institutions, both national and abroad. Welcome, Valerie. Our final guest this evening is Mr. Wayne Bumpers. Mr. Bumpers is an award-winning concert pianist and a full-time tenured faculty member and coordinator of the keyboard arts area at Miami-Dade College, Kendall Campus. At the age of 18, he made his concert stage debut performing with the New Orleans Symphony Orchestra. He is the founder and artistic director of the Miami-Dade College High School Piano Competition and the Piano Sonata Competition. He is also the former choir director of the award-winning Juba Gospel Ensemble. Mr. Bumper is a sought-after composer and arranger. He maintains a private piano studio in Miami and has been a leader in church music ministry for over 30 years. Welcome, Wayne. Um, and for our guest, if you have any questions, just want you to know that the chat um, is available. So please feel free to put your questions in the chat and we will be answering them at the end of the discussion. And from this point, I will hand the microphone over to you, Johan. Thank you, Valerie. I appreciate that introduction. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. I'm delighted to be uh, moderating this. Uh, and I hope everybody who is listening and would forgive me if I unashamedly say how proud I am of the Heritage Committee and the folks at the Arsh Center for putting together this series and, uh, and for, them to, for me to be able to call them my colleagues. Um, I'm looking forward to this uh, discussion. Uh, we're going to dive deep uh, into the theme, but also into 
the very deeply personal uh, feelings that this music evokes. Uh, the nature of Songs of Freedom is such that you cannot be neutral to it, uh, and it moves you in many ways, as we heard at the beginning of this discussion. So I hope uh, for the next 40 or so minutes you will enjoy the discussion. We had a brief rehearsal a few days ago, and I have to tell you, I'm still excited from that, and you're in for a for a treat. These three panelists are experts, but they are beautifully and they are beautifully able to powerfully communicate uh, their love for this music and their knowledge and their passion. So um, here we go. We're going to go on a journey um, through the power and the impact of songs of freedom, and some might say it includes songs of slavery, of course, uh, from its genesis all the way back to when African slaves were being brought to the U.S., as somebody said, as faceless cargo uh, through the civil rights movement uh, and to our modern day social justice and Black Lives Matter struggles. Uh, but I'd like to start on a personal level. Uh, I want to ask our panel, and I'm going to start with you, Wayne, and, and then I'll come over to Brenda and, and, and then Valerie. Uh, so, Wayne, um, the question, the same question for all three of you. If you think, if you hear the phrase uh, songs of freedom or songs of slavery and, and, and you just think uh, about that phrase, I'd like to know what goes through your mind, uh, what does it evoke, but also importantly, what, do, what bubbles up from your heart? Um, and, and is that so clear that you can describe it in two words? Wayne? Wow. Uh, yes. Um, thank you for having me, by the way. Uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, when I hear songs of freedom, uh, the, immediately I think of the songs that I've heard all my life in my church, in my community, uh, in my school. Uh, it, you know, it's the songs of freedom. You, we, 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 it's, it's a part of our culture. It's a part of our community. Uh, the words that, that come to my mind are, songs that talk about cur the courage to to even seek freedom um, or pursue it I should mm -hmm. say and um, we think um, about the hope that it gives people when you hear this music thank you we'll come back to that but I just wanted that sort of first flash of, of association that you have thank you Wayne I appreciate that uh, Brenda, what about you? What, what jumps into your mind and into your heart? Uh, well, what jumps into my mind is that I'm looking at my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, and I think I'm the senior citizen here. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I was actually alive and active in the 60s. Um, so I heard and, and learned from kind of the experience. Um, and when Wayne said hope, that's exactly one of the words that, that comes to my mind. But faith, faith mm -hmm. is very, it, it's kind of like hope, but it's more than hope because mm -hmm. faith means persistence. Mm -hmm. You know, when you hope for something, you kind of dream of it, but when you have faith in what's going to happen, you have faith that you're going to make it, then you do more than you thought you could do. And the other word um, I think I told you before was defiance. Mm. Mm. You will not hold me down. Ain't gonna mm. let nobody turn me around. Mm. Hold on a little while longer. Everything's gonna be all right. All of those were songs that were a part of the movement, um, you know, back when I was coming up. So those were the two, three. I guess I gave you three, didn't I? No. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you. I'm going to penalize you for that one. <laughs> and if I could just say, um, Brenda, we both grew up in the 60s. So oh, uh, you don't look as old as I am. <laughs> growing up in South Africa as a white boy, my growing up was very different from yours. Okay. So, so our perspective on this is interesting. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and it certainly has had an, a huge impact on me, this mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. uh, Valerie, what about you? For me, um, if I could describe these words, I would say um, strategic communication, mm -hmm. because as we're trying to um, 
give one another strength to hold on um, and give each other faith to know that um, what a moment is happening um, is in passing and that better times will come. Um, and also the method that we use for, um, you know, these anthems of stri strategic communication meant to get a person from one place to the next in the Underground Railroad, all of these things, um, because we had to do them, we had to sing them in secret, you know, all we had were our voices and all we have are our voices. So uh, strategic communication and the concept of anthems as well. Mm -hmm. Anthems to me, I am, um, as a creator, I think automatically about how to create anthems. And, you know, I'm, I'm fortunate enough to um, be in a position to create anthems every now and then for particular, um, uh, working with particular organizations and, and um, having the privilege of being able to send out or create messages that um, are designed to bring people together. And I've always felt that anthems and hope and, and the strategic communication comes through certain um, musical devices. Um, the idea of a major triad, we know a major triad. Ah. Um, a major triad is used in anthems because that major sound is a feeling of positivity and it's a feeling of strength and there's familiarity to it. So from steal away and swing low to young, gifted and black, um, all of these, they have those major sounding intervals that allow us to be lifted up um, within the music that we hear. So anthems, strategic communication. Those are my three words. <laughs> you all did great. Uh, and, and if I compare what all of you said to what, what Martin Luther King said about this music, he said, they, they, they give the people a new courage, which is a word we heard, and a sense of unity. I think they keep alive a faith, a radiant hope in the future and particularly in our most trying hours. A lot of commonality between how he described it and what I heard from the panel. Um, mm -hmm. a, a, a little bit more personal from each of you um, and, and your career and your perspective and your biographies, which we just heard. So I'm gonna start with you, Valerie. Um, you are clearly as a composer and a composer for mostly instrumental music, you're clearly inspired by deep spiritual, cultural experiences and roots. Uh, and you can say a little bit about that if you want to. Uh, have you, would you say that you've composed music based on songs of freedom? And, and how does this translate to instrumental music without lyrics? Well, I have to tell you first and foremost that when I studied composition, I was kicked out of the composition department. And, and it was, it was because I was in a position where I did not look like the others around me. Mm. And, but it was during that time that I was searching out spirituals and I was searching out composers who were influenced and impacted by those because I needed more than anything um, within this, this, this white man's world. Of, of composing that, you know, Beethoven and Brahms, um, within this world, I needed something to adhere to, to cling on to. And so automatically um, tapping back into the roots and heritage of listening to uh, Motown and Earth, Wind and Fire and, and, and Billie Holiday and Duke Ellington and all those things growing up, uh, they were a main source of strength and influence. So, um, Writing, writing uh, music that up is uplifting was something that I automatically wanted to do because I needed that purpose. Mm -hmm. I grew up, I grew up in West Louisville, y'all, um, which is um, my home is about a couple of blocks away from where Breonna Taylor was shot and killed. And it's also about four blocks up and two blocks over from where Muhammad Ali's house was. Um, so um, growing up, growing up in that neighborhood um, taught me a lot. And one of the things that um, taught me a lot was the, um, the, the strength of elders 
And those elders, they were so responsible for us um, getting getting our religion <laughs> and, and learning, to, learning to grow up with a high um, sense of integrity. And part of that was through singing. Part of that was through the communication of music. And so my experiences were within that and also the role that my mom played um, in, in the neighborhood. You know, she, um, my mom is, how old is my mom? She's 78 years old. And for 50 years of that, she's been running a daycare in that neighborhood. Um, and so she's been kind of the big mama, not only to me and my sisters, but also to an entire, mm-hmm. and she knew how to bring out, um, bring out the talents in people and children. And so we had an organ in the back, um, in the back of the house, this, oh, excuse me, this old keyboard. Um, and that was a part of our playtime. Uh, me and my sisters, we used to sit there and just, you know, pound out notes. And I'm, I'm a child of the 70s. So y'all know all about the uh, hope um, the cassette players. We had eight tracks, but you know, it's all about the cassette players around the late seventies, um, where people just seemed to get those more for Christmas. That was kind of the Elmo doll of the seventies, the cassette player. Um, but for me sitting at that, that keyboard and it had that Hammond sound to it. It wasn't a Hammond y'all trust me, but, (laughs) but it had that, that, that sound. And playing just one note and and holding it down and listening to it sing out and just trying to create melodies and things because there was a sustain that allowed us to enjoy that that singing quality and also sing along with it. Mm -hmm. I used to record on one and then play it back. And then while that's playing, try to play another melody and then... (laughs) and record on the other cassette player. Two years in a row, we got cassette players for Christmas. So back and forth, back and forth was um, how the layers would build and record. And that's how um, I started to develop an inner ear as, as a composer. So the roots of composition came from that, came from the influences of the neighborhood um, and came from spirituals. And it And I'd like to think that it is what gets you know, Black students through um, these education settings where they're the only ones, Mm -hmm. knowing that they can tap into the roots and the history of a people um, to give them strength to to move on. And so for me, that was something that I wanted to, that gave me purpose um, to write things that were along those lines that handed off strength, that handed off the sense of unity um, and when Imani Wins came together um, to, to do our thing, that was a part of it. And I was always making sure, it's, it's very important that spirituals were a part of the repertoire that we would play. Even though we were instrumentalists, um, to me, I was thinking the sounds and the energy and the meanings of spirituals um, are all so imbued in the melodies alone. You can feel the words through the melodies. So for instrumentalists to play that and for instrumentalists to know those words in advance, then it informs the interpretation that comes across. So um, I love the words of spirituals and I, and I always listen to them, but I really believe that the melodies are powerful in and of themselves. Oh, thank you. Wow. Um, There's so much to think about there, Valerie. I I appreciate that. and I'm sure we'll have echoes of that throughout the conversation. Uh, Wayne, I want to come to you and 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 uh, make sure we, uh, we we hear your perspective on this question. Um, I know you have deep involvement in your profession and private involvement as a musician with with church and gospel music. And I can't help asking you about the connection between religion and songs of freedom because it seems to me from the oldest versions of slavery songs or spirituals uh, all the way to the modern songs, there always seems to be a conversation with God somewhere. Mm. What is that link and what, 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 is that, what does that make you think about, Wayne? The first song that comes to mind, up above my head, I hear music in the air. Mm. There, you go. there must be a God somewhere. So, you know, the songs of the church have always spoke, uh, they, they always speak of freedom uh, in some way because that is what we believe in our church about what Jesus does to the soul when you're saved. 
you've been set free from sin or uh, there's always some liberty there that you are going to uh, acquiesce to because it is what we think and, and we know about. And of course, um, this is passed down throughout, uh, not just from the church, but even in the community. So the songs are birth in, in an experience. And it was so interesting to hear Valerie talk about having the uh, organ in the back of the house <laughs> where you push that one note and it sounds like a Hammond organ. You know, we've all, she's, her experience sounds so similar to mine where you have a, a mother who's in the community that everybody kind of gravitates to. It was the same experience as mine uh, in our home. Uh, it's like the kids played in our yard as opposed to anywhere else. So my mother and father were the parents of the community. So um, you hear this music in our churches, in our community, and it's not just in church because most people in the community went to church. You know, I'm mean, from a black community. Uh, they were mostly church people. And when you go to anyone's house, if they have a, if they have a piano there, they're going to gather around and sing. That's just the way it's done, you know. Um, yeah. and, and we're going to sing church songs. Uh, and, and before you know, before the hour is over, we're singing Earth, Wind, and Fire songs, you know. So it's just <laughs> not the church. <laughs> we started out with Jesus, but we ended up somewhere else. <laughs> Yeah. So, you know, you know, Lionel Richie, whatever it was, it was there. It's a part of how we uh, live, you know. They all started in church too. Yeah, yeah, they, they, right. 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 So it, it's, it's not uncommon to uh, see the dichotomy there coming together, uh, <laughs> of, you know, secular and sacred. Um, but I, um, I guess I'm kind of getting away from your question a little bit because I'm having so many different thoughts. But uh, that at least gives you some perspective of how our community operates. It's just not about the church. It is a strong influence, yeah. but there's so much music around. One of the other things I want to bring to attention is that when Valerie mentioned about the major triad, this is so interesting. She should mention the major triad, whereas most of our music is in minor. And we still have joy in the minor key. Yes. <laughs> and, and that kind of confuses people. Like, well, how can you be so happy when you're singing in this minor key with this? Because it's in the beat. Uh, I guess the, uh, I assume rather that the music being in minor and the rhythms being upbeat uh, mm -hmm. sounds like a contradiction. But really, it's sort of like how we live. It's mm -hmm. the, it, it's. The oppression that we feel, but yet, again, I go to that word that I gave you earlier uh, at the beginning of the conversation, courage and hope. Mm -hmm. So even when you hear a song about nobody knows the trouble I've seen, nobody knows but you, Lord. You know, that's a major key, of course. But at the end of that verse, it, what does he say? After all that trouble, glory, hallelujah. <laughs> And so there's always this hope that comes from the spirituals and to our hand clapping songs going up yonder, you know, uh, by Walter Hawkins. Um, and, you know, this is oh happy day change and even changing hymns that we that that we know to fit the beat and the style of our, our yeah. community and our culture. So, you know, we might, we might end up with a choir here tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to get to you. I mean, you're a beautiful singer, and I just heard that song that you sent us. It's gorgeous. Uh, and, um, mm. and, and, but I also know as a retired teacher, as you said earlier, um, you have many, you know, many things that you care about, but you say that the things that you, two things that you're really passionate about now is, is uh, teaching children and making music, those two things. And I just wondered if those two passions are so strong in you, what do we teach children about songs of freedom? And what do songs of freedom teach our children? Well, when you say songs of freedom, we, we, still, we still go back to yeah. the, the songs of, of faith, songs of hope. And I think that the children need to understand that even though there was slavery, or because there was slavery, there was also persistence and courage. And mm. that's what 
those are values that children need to learn. Mm -hmm. And when they see me as a black woman standing up in their, in their, their auditoriums on the stage and, and communicating with them, they see somebody that is an example, really. And, and teaching black music to them is, it, it, I mean, it's amazing to see their, their responses. Many of them have never heard some of these songs. Mm -hmm. And this is partly due to our modern day times. You know, we're, we're living in, a, is in some crazy times now. Parents have three jobs. Some of the children don't see their parents, even on the weekends, you know, they, they go to this one's house, that one's house. And so it's so important to me to do, to share what I know. I guess that's the bottom line, to share what I know, to share what has given me strength and to let them see a person that they may not have known about before. You know, I'm, I, I'm a black woman. I've done this in white schools. I mean, many of our schools are still segregated. And then our black children, my goodness, when I tell them that they are possibly descendants of kings and queens, they look at me like I'm crazy, <laughs> you know? But then we, I tell the story. And in that story are some of those songs. And it really, really does broaden their understanding. And I have yet, for children to leave one of my school concerts and not feel uplifted. It's such a blessing to be able to do that. Yeah. Well, I want to stay with this theme of impact because, I mean, all of us will agree with one thing is music and the arts in general, but music is impactful. Uh, it transforms you, you. You listen to it and it does something. There's a response. And so I want to stay with you, Brenda. I have a lot of questions and we want to get to audience questions. So I'm not going to put all, every question to all three of you, but if you want to add something, please feel free to do that. So Brenda, I want, I want to stay with you with this question about impact and specifically personal impact. I should say to our listeners, we've, we've been looking and compiling a really amazing playlist of songs of, of slavery and songs of freedom all the way to, to the modern era. And I think some of these songs will be made available to our audience after the, the discussion. And in that playlist, Brenda, is there a song that particularly impacted you, resonated with you? Maybe it helped you do it through a tough time. Maybe it helped somebody else in your family through a tough time. Can you describe a moment of personal impact? There are some wonderful, wonderful songs in <laughs> this playlist. And I'm actually looking at it again now, and I keep changing my mind. <laughs> but I love Lift Every Voice and Sing. Yes. I love the song. I just love it because of the words, every single verse. Um, Let us march on till victory is won. You know, it mm. ends like that. And to me, that is the embodiment of what our people started out, grew, and became. You know, and that that just that makes mm. me verklempt. <laughs> <laughs> I love that song. Wayne, Valerie, do you want to add anything about a, a a particular song that may have really impacted you? Mm. Steal away. Mm -hmm. And the reason why was because it represents one of the first um, spirituals um, that arranged for a woodwind quintet setting. And um, it was pivotal to us because we, the very first reading, we just sat back and it just, the pieces all came together in terms of our, our focus and our purpose. And um, the group had already been together for many years, but um, I believe it was, I can't remember, maybe 2010 when Gregory Hines had passed away. And this image of him walking, um, walking backstage um, slowly in the way that he walked um, gave this groove and this asinato to the melody of Steal Away. So I, I knew I had to, to pin that in dedication to him. And from there, that 
that piece became just something that we would we would play everywhere as a means of of solidarity and also a means of of expressing healing and and hope and and transformation so steal away okay thank you uh, Wayne. i want to i want to ask you about impact as well but impact on society and, and, and broader uh, you know, we, I've already said music is really powerful and it and it and it's transformative. And and I can speak from experience as a white South African when I I realized at some stage how how horrible apartheid was, how impactful this kind of music was to me as a listener. So the impact is mm-hmm. both on the singer and on the listener. And I just wondered, would you say that freedom music or slavery music has fueled the cultural and social revolution in the U.S. Uh, I want yes, yes, I would say so, uh, and it also influenced popular artists to create new songs, not just the church music that we've heard created by the you know the slaves right. as far back as you know as that time. But when you hear, hear a song by James Brown, "Say It Loud," I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> it gives an affirmation to the community that you should not be ashamed of who you are as much as people are trying to marginalize you. So you you have these kinds of songs that are uplifting to the community, even outside of the church. And there's nothing um, negative about that. It's just affirming to, of yourself. I'm, I'm black and I'm proud. I wouldn't want to be anybody else but me right now. <laughs> I love being black, you know, and, and, and you would have to have my experience to understand where I'm coming from. And there are people who try to steal that experience through cultural appropriation or whatever. But you don't know this story, mm-hmm. you know, and I'm going to say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. I like Everything about my culture, from those who we call bourgeois, which I might be a part of that community, but <laughs> <laughs> until the ones we call ghetto, I understand it. I grew up around it. I went to church in it, and both on what they call both sides of the track, yeah. you know. And so this, it, and it, it meets me everywhere because I was listening to Valerie's uh, comment earlier where she mentioned, you know, she went, she was thrown out of this composition of. Uh, the apartment, I wasn't thrown out of my, de- <laughs> my piano performance degree, but I was the first African American to receive both my bachelor's and master's degrees from the university I attended. And this is in the 80s. Right. We're not talking about the 60s or the 50s. Yeah. This is the 80s. This is the first time you've seen a black pianist come to your school to get a performance degree, you know, but it, it just speaks volumes of, of, of our experiences, you know. Um, we not only can do what we do in our community, but we can do other things, you know. So uh, say it loud. I'm black and I'm proud. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Brenda, Brenda, yes. can, can you think of a, an example of a piece of music or the, the genre having acted as a catalyst for change in the U.S.? Um, the Freedom Songs definitely have had a... <laughs> I can't repeat your question, have been a catalyst of change. And I, 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 my brain goes to jazz. Okay. The, jazz was protest music okay. during the, the 60s, yeah. you know, and 70s. Um, the, the manner of the presentations, the freedom. And then, you know, uh, certain people called it avant-garde. The, the musicians didn't call it avant-garde. They called it playing. And then some of the compositions uh, were written because of, of, of events that happened. I, I, I've had a conversation with um, somebody and I found out that through this song list that John Coltrane's Alabama, mm. a song that I loved listening to, I just loved the, the, the free way he played. I love I loved the passion. I, I loved how it made me feel inside. I had no idea that that composition was written for the four little girls who were killed in the bombing in Mm -hmm. in the 16th Street Church in 1963. I didn't know that. And yeah, and I 
ironically, the way things come full circle, you talk about personal impact, that favorite song of mine is on this list. And in, late, in my 40s, I married the brother-in-law of Carol Robertson, one of the little girls. My mm-hmm. husband is the ex-brother-in-law of one of those little girls. And I've always loved that song didn't know that, that, you know, it would become a part of my family connection. So you talk about personal. <laughs> oh, oh, you're going deep. I, yeah. I it's awesome yeah. how the, the, that story links. Um, uh, Valerie, just, just uh, staying on impact, but maybe a little broader, uh, uh, how this has impacted on our culture. I, I heard a, 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 a podcast by uh, New York Times critic Wesley Morris, and I don't know if any of you saw this, but he makes a powerfully but simple case uh, for the songs of freedom and the songs of slavery being the root of American music, full stop. He says from the 1800s to today, this is the very DNA of American pop culture. Mm-hmm. So the impact on our culture as a country, uh, you want to say something about that, Valerie, or something related to that question? Sure, yeah. Well, I automatically go to the relationship between um, composer Harry T. Burley and Antonin Dvorak. Um, and Antonin, Antonin Dvorak, he, was, um, he came to this country because he was looking for um, the song of the people, the song of the folk. And his relationship with Harry T. Burley um, was that came out of fascination out of the African American culture, um, the songs of the slave. And um, after hearing these songs, after having many um, sharing sessions of this music with Burley, um, Antonin Dvorak declared that uh, spirituals in particular were the future of American music, were the future of classical music. And so um, this love, once again, we're talking about the triads. And, you know, it's funny because I I said a major triad, but if you think about the major triad, it's built on one major interval and one minor interval. It is. So it's it's (laughs) both there, right? They're both there. Um, it's, it's, it's right there. Yep. Yes. And so going home mm. written by Antonin Dvorak that became a part of these songs that became a part of, um, the spirituals as we know it and how they influence the freedom songs that we listen to now, that is, um, an indelible connection that it's up to, um, black artists to keep that in the strain of the development of American music. And I I don't even think we need to do much to keep it there. We stay true to ourselves. Um, But it's such an influence on every genre of music that we know about. So to me, that is a very, very powerful thing. But yeah, that relationship between Dvorak and Burley, I think is a quintessential influence that spirituals and, and have the power in, in terms of impacting others. And of course, Dvorak went on to write the New World Symphony because of his experience here and uh, with that song in it. Um, right. Yeah. Um, so uh, before I go back to the playlist and ask you a little bit more about, about that, uh, I just want to say to our audience, if you're listening in, we have about 10 minutes left. Um, as you can tell, there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but we don't want to forget you and forget your questions. And so please use the chat at the bottom of your screen, or if you're using a different device, it's probably not at the bottom of your screen, but there's a chat function. Use that and, and, and pop your questions over to us and, and I'll try to get a couple of them into the panelists before we run out of time. Um, but we're hearing such rich sharing. I don't want to forget about our audience and they, they might want to uh, ask the panel something. Um, so back to the playlist, um, has the essence of the songs and their coded meanings, I mean, you talked earlier, Valerie, about this sort of sense of intentional planning or an agenda with this music, the, the sort of intentionality between the music and the, and the organized uh, intention of it over time. Uh, I just wonder whether the coded meaning and, and that impact has changed over historic periods 
from slavery to civil rights to Black Lives Matter. Are there differences? Are there are there common threads in terms of that sort of essence or that the coded messages of these songs? I'm going to start with Wayne, uh, and then I'll go around if anybody else wants to add to that. Repeat the last part of your question. I, I'm kind of missed that. I'm wondering whether over time, as this music, the genre developed, whether the essence of the songs and their coded meanings changed, or whether mm. basically throughout the period they had the same sort of uh, agenda, if I can call it that. Uh, they probably did change. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of some of the ones that we have on the song list. Um, I, you know, I would imagine this little light of mine is just general singing uh, for any Sunday school child or any church congregational singing. Mm. It could be your your Christian experience or your personal life experience. You know, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Uh, could have meant or... or possibly meant in the in when it was first written that no matter how you try to persecute me i'm still going to shine mm. and mm. so when you get to a more modern time it's talking about my christianity i'm going to be the light for the community uh i'm going to be that person you can look up to um you know, it can have very s- s- various meanings to that one particular song that i can think of quickly you know, um but you know, yes, I think things do change over time. I mean, we even have vocabulary that changes over time. We talk, I talk about this with my classes, where the use of the word gay in the 1890s meant a very uh, a happy, cheerful person. And, and now we use that to talk about someone's sexual proclivity. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. And even the use of the cell phone or the internet, how it was used by the military, you know. So things over time do change. So... I would imagine the music does too, but there's still that history that's Mm. there with the song. Brenda, um, uh, same question, but also I wonder how have musicians and the movement inspired one another? Is it a chicken egg? Which one inspires which one over time? Can you say something about your thoughts on that? Yeah. um... Yeah. Okay, because I was all set to talk about this little light of mine. But, <laughs> you can <laughs> but, continue. Please. <laughs> so, but let me answer your question, and then I want to get back to this little light of mine, because that's so juicy to me. Mm. Um, your question is uh, the chicken egg uh, uh, syndrome. Art Blakey. One, you know, jazz giant made a statement that just, you know, resonates among so many musicians and goes down in history. And it's so true. Um, in the 20th century, mo- there, there are very few black jazz musicians that did not come out of the church. And their music was always a throwback and they were always influenced by the church. And mm-hmm. even rhythms, the double claps, the you know the 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 double bass. Uh, there was a dr- there was a drummer from Baltimore, Dennis Butcher, I think his name is, and he per- perfected that double bass, dr- you know, drum thing. So yes, the 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 music that the 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 old songs affected what the jazz musicians and other musicians too, because James Brown said it. Every single instrument is a drum. <laughs> he said the trumpet player is a drum, the singer is a drum. You got to keep that rhythm going. So yes. rhythm was, was the foundation of the church. When I first walked into the little church that I joined when I was a preteen, wasn't my mother's church. It was a church my girlfriend went to. And these people were from North Carolina. And <laughs> oh, yeah. And they and the male chorus was standing there, and they would shuffle and stomp, shuffle and stomp, mm-hmm. shuffle. I had never seen anything like that in my life. I was fascinated. That was the church that I. That is my church. You know, that was my church. Yeah. That was it for me. So that, in terms of the music affecting the, the I mean, the old music affecting what came out. Absolutely mm-hmm. yes. Now I want to get back to look this little light of mine. <laughs> <laughs> I used to teach a, I taught a lesson 
And I've had the children think about what the slaves went through and they persisted on escaping. And they came up with the scenario that this, this little, when I go up the road, I'm gonna let it shine. So they said that, that, they, that the people were telling their friends, giving signals with a lantern in the darkness on the road. Mm -hmm. And they would sing different verses to give them clues as to which, where to look. And I'm, I, the children made this up. And this happened, you know, not just with one class, but I, 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 I did this with several classes over the years. And the kids, they came up with these scenarios. And to me, it makes common sense that maybe this really did happen. You know, I wasn't there, so I can't state it for fact. But can you imagine yeah. someone who is escaping and carrying a lantern in the dark of night? And, 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 and singing in the field. When I go this way, look for my life. When I go that way, look for my life. And this is how people escaped. Maryland is where I'm from. And, I, and the stories of Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, and Josiah Collins, who was my great-great-grandfather, these were stories. Well, uh, thank you, Brenda. As you say, that is juicy. That, that's good. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, I want to get a, a couple questions in, and I, I hope we have time for two here. So let me just uh, uh, read one of the questions from <laughs> one of our audiences, and I'm going to direct it to you, Valerie, just to kick off here. Do you expect new music or songs to come out of these current troubled times, and how will those resonate with heritage of freedom songs? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely because during this time we need it the most. Music is created when you need it the most, when your souls are downtrodden, when you are facing any kind of opposition or resistance, songs are what get you through. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, it's already happening. There are many of us who are just going out and, and creating these anthems, um, one of which is Seven O'Clock Shout, I'm gonna plug a concert that's about to happen with Philadelphia Orchestra um, at seven o'clock. Seven o'clock shout is an anthem for solidarity that they're, they're performing um, that has a lot to do with the fact that the isolation and solitude that we've all been experiencing and how at when the um, essential workers come home at seven, the banging of pots and pans um, are ringing through the air because we're not only saying we appreciate you, but we're also saying we are still alive and we're living for another day and we've mm -hmm. survived. And this is how I'm going to connect to you. It's very much like that call and response tradition, calling over long distances to um, communicate history, to communicate the news, to communicate a person's arrival. Music has that purpose that is integral to our survival. I like to argue as much as important as food and water because you have to feed your spirit. And so within these modern times, yes, we're, we're using all the songs of the past. We, we remember them, we teach them to our children, um, but we're also creating new songs as well because we have a purpose and it's not limited to any one demographic. We're all in this together and we all have to be together right now in this crazy, crazy time <laughs> to survive. We need that unity. So um, yeah, these songs are coming together by Thank all means. Thank necessary. you. And, and I want to squeeze one more last question in, and I'm going to come to you, Wayne. Um, so we, Valerie's question was about modern times. I want to go way back now and way back to Africa. Brenda mentioned drums. And, and, and there's a question here about, can we talk about the drum mm. for freedom and resistance in, in, during oppression and enslavement? all the way, you know, African drumming and African rhythms mm -hmm. that came here. Can we talk, can you say a little bit about that? Uh, yes, but you probably should have asked Brenda. <laughs> but, but I'll try to answer this question the best I can. Uh, one thing we know about the drum is that it was a communicative uh, instrument. So from one village to the other, they send signals through rhythms. And, and you will wonder why they would, uh, 
make that instrument against the law to be used by Africans once they came to the new world called the United okay. States of America. So uh, it's a powerful instrument. It brings community together. They have community drumming uh, circles. I mean, the rhythms are speaking to us at all times and they're different beats that mean different things. So um, yeah, when we go back and look at the drum, it's an important instrument in um, our music. For sure. Brenda could probably expound even more on that since she's the, the jazz expert on the panel here. Right. <laughs> Brenda, I, the, you want to have the last word? Absolutely. The, the expert is always the first to admit that there's a whole lot I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, a, that's important. However, let me, let me talk to you about that drum for a minute because that was the first thing that was banned. Mm -hmm. that yes. the, the, the Africans were not allowed to touch a drum because that would have been mm -hmm. communication. And, it, and, and, and drums were, could be used for a, as a tool for up, uprising. Yes, yeah, right. So that, they were banned. So mm. drum circles that we have, you know, and, and they, they came, I, I, I first experienced drum circles uh, during, actually during the, the civil rights time. And it was so such a precious thing in our community. I mean, you know, we would go to the park and and just a, just a thing of beauty because there was had been so much repression over the drum, yeah. over the drum. So uh, the drum is a symbol of freedom, and that I really feel is why some of the 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 most intense protest jazz music was was perpetrated by drummers mm. drummers now mm. i'd like to add to that uh i just had a thought uh i grew up in the missionary baptist church mm -hmm. uh where i still serve as a music minister but today's times are so much different than when i was young oh, yeah and in those days when i was younger the drum was you could not bring a drum set into right. my church in alabama that's right. Because it was considered to be the worldly instrument, which now I'm thinking about it. Mm. I think they bought into the slave master's narrative mm -hmm. of keeping you from communicating and there appreciating you who you were. Now, mm. we have um, evolved since to know better that that's not uh, yeah. the case. And I used to always wonder. So I, I, I even got in trouble once. I have to give you all this little story. I used to have a gospel choir in high school. And they invited that choir to my home church. And of course, we had drums, guitars, of course, electronic pianos and everything and the singers and whatnot. And I thought since they invited us, they were going to accept us the way we, we, you know, we were organized. We were told that we could not come in with those drums and guitars because they would only allow the piano and the organ to be played, not even a tambourine. Now, that's not to say all of the churches were that way, but my particular church was. And uh, now if you go to that same church, all kinds of instruments are in the yeah. place. So we evolve, you know, over time to realize. I used to always, as a young person, used to think, you know, the Bible even says, you know, let praise uh, them with everything. Right? With the, praise them with the instruments, with the loud sounding cymbals. Mm -hmm. Why are you denying this instrument to be a part of your worship experience? I didn't understand it as a young kid. This was just something that they had organized. And, you know, I guess I was the rebellious one because I would not allow my choir to sing that night because I thought if you invited my family here, you were going to accept them and I would not allow them to sing. Now, my mother had a problem with that, but she understood <laughs> uh, where I was coming from eventually, you know. So, but um, uh, that was just some, a, a memory that I had about an experience of mine growing up in the South. In Alabama, yeah. I'm not going to give any names of any institutions. <laughs> but we're, we're gonna we're gonna have to end on that defiant note, there, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> yes, defiance. Yes. I love that. I love that. The good way to end. Uh, we run out of time, and I just can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this, and how humbled I am to listen to the wealth of stories that you're generously sharing with us. So, thank you, Wayne. Thank you, Brenda. Thank you, Valerie. Thank you. Back to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing Thank this. You. Yes. yes.
Wow, that was a, a magnificent discussion, and 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 yes, time just flew by. I can't I can't believe it's already. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, on behalf of the Art Center, I just want to thank you all for joining us today, Brenda, Valerie, Wayne, Johan. You you were incredible. It was absolutely incredible. We also want to thank uh, the caption crew for, for providing closed captioning for this afternoon's event. And to our audience, if you've been inspired, enlightened, encouraged, we ask you to consider donating to the Art Center's Miami Diaspora Fund so that we can continue programming events like this. Text SONGS to 91999 to donate, or you can click the mobile cause link you received in your confirmation email. We invite all of you to join us next month for our second Heritage Project webinar scheduled for October the 28th. Our theme will be the Afro-Latinx music experience. And in closing, I'd like to remind everyone the deadline to register to vote in Florida is Monday, October the 5th. To register to vote and to check your voter registration status, which is also very important, please visit registertovoteflorida.gov. Again, registertovoteflorida.gov. Again, thank everyone for joining us. And until next time, good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all. So Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Great job, everybody. It was wonderful. Thank you for having me.